Hello, and welcome to the online Performance Studios presentation of Oneness, Emily Carr in Words, Music, and Art. The words simplicity and directness are an apt description of both Emily Carr's exterior self and the expression of her inner beliefs. Her artistry also embodies noble, even heroic, personal values, and those same values which she so admired in others honesty, sincerity, and strength. It had been a difficult struggle for a woman born in 1871 in the imperialized provincial capital of Victoria, British Columbia, in Canada. The role of most women at that time was limited to either rearing children or to teaching them. Women did not even have the right to vote until 1917, when Carr herself was middle-aged. Victoria stood like a gawky girl waiting to be a grown-up city, Emily writes. The city was also home to large numbers of First Nations people and Chinese laborers. Emily had once described herself as a little old lady on the edge of nowhere. A rather truthful summing up of the geographical, artistic, and emotional isolation in which she had developed as an artist. While Victoria itself was removed from the more vibrant mainland city of Vancouver by a six-hour ferry ride, the entire province was separated from the rest of Canada by the Great Barrier of the Rocky Mountains. Of her own birth, Emily wrote, My dear little mother wrestled bravely, and I was born, and the storm has never quite lulled in my life. I've always been tossing and wrestling and buffeting it. The art of Emily Carr is a virtual portrait of the artist's lifelong search for meaning and expression, from her beginnings as a traditional artist through her explorations of new styles and influences, to her ultimate discovery of a highly personal manner of visual and verbal expression. My hope is that today's presentation will provide you with valuable insights into Emily Carr's inner spirit and personality embodying traits which so shaped the artistry of this extraordinary Canadian treasure. So please, sit back and enjoy the music, the song, the artworks, and the great beauty which is about to unfold before you.
Interspersed throughout our basically chronological view of Carr's life in this presentation, we will be focusing in on just a few of Emily Carr's extensive journal writings in which she speaks of the oneness of life and the synchronicity of nature, beauty, and creation. This concept of oneness is clearly reflected in her conceptualization and interpretation of God. In her published journal, Hundreds and Thousands, she comes back to this basic inspirational feature of her work time and time again, speaking of it fervently and eloquently. It was as though she were devoted to nature, which was the breath of life itself, a nature whose name was God. The only thing worth striving for is to express God. Every living thing is God made manifest. All real art is the eternal seeking to express God, the one substance out of which all things are made. Emily Carr. After initial studies in San Francisco in her mid-twenties, Emily returned to Victoria to teach while earning money for future studies in Europe. Emily did travel and eventually finished a quite uneventful and even disastrous tenure in England where she not only landed in a sanatorium for 18 months because of chronic illnesses developed there, but she sadly destroyed nearly all of her artwork from this particular period. Emily, however, arrived home safely to some attention from the Victoria Press. An article entitled, Miss Carr Returns from Five Years Study Under English Masters, perhaps exaggerated her accomplishments. Nevertheless, she got a part-time job as a political cartoonist in a Victoria publication called The Week. As far as art was concerned, however, Victoria remained locked in the conservative 19th century. It was with some relief that Carr accepted an invitation to teach at the Vancouver Studio Club. 
Although she was enthusiastic about the move to Vancouver, the job of teaching the society ladies at the studio club was both unsuccessful and short-lived. Carr was too serious for the matrons, and they were not serious enough for her. But younger students appreciated her insistence on working directly from nature, both in the studio as well as in nearby Stanley Park, with its gigantic peaks of pines and cedar boughs. As an artist, Emily soon became dissatisfied with the genteel style of watercolor painting which she had studied in England, finding that it did not really capture the bigness and stark reality of her work. When she heard reports about the new art, that claimed broader seeing, she set her sights on Paris to learn more about it. In July of 1910, Emily Carr sailed for France from Quebec City, taking along her sister Alice to act as companion and interpreter. My sister knew French, but would not talk, Carr recalled. I did not know French, but would not learn. Very simply, she says, I wanted now to find out what this new art was about. In the spring of 1899, before she made her Paris sojourn, Emily was invited by a missionary friend to travel to Uklulit, Nutanult, the Nuka Reserve on the west coast of Vancouver Island. This no doubt planted the deep seeds of love for a culture and society that would fill many of her future canvases. It was on this trip that Emily earned the native name Kliwik, which means laughing one. Never interested in learning other languages, Emily managed to communicate with the Nutka solely by nodding, gesturing, and smiling. She must have just exuded her joy at finding this treasureful society while giggling away in her instability with the Nutka language. Regarding herself, though, as someone who lived outside conventional society, she truly felt a bond with these people whose culture was so distinct. And now, after France, Emily Carr returned once again to Vancouver, and in July of 1912, she bravely set out on one of her most ambitious excursions into northern British Columbia. Equipped with painting supplies, a portable easel, blankets and food to survive in what would be uncertain living conditions, Emily was accompanied by her constant companion, her sheepdog, Billy. Her first stops were in the Indian villages on the east coast of Vancouver Island. In these villages, she discovered the people and images that would inspire her to a glorious array of the usage of primary colors. She used her reds, blues, and yellows to illuminate totems and carved figures which lined the landscape, 
spread winged ravens, large community houses. As for her recent experience in France, Emily writes, I could not go back to the old dead way of working after I have tasted the joys of the new. The new ideas are big and they fit this big land. After only two months of travel, Emily had produced close to 200 new works. We will stray briefly from our chronological path at this point and introduce a man who would prove to be a great, great force and inspiration in Emily's life. His name is Lauren Harris, an original member of the famous Canadian group of seven who at this time would be developing into his own as an artist. For many years after their initial meeting in 1927, Emily Carr and Lauren Harris maintained an intense correspondence. This exchange was particularly valuable to Carr 
because it allowed her to clarify and explore new concepts in times of confusion and frustration. How was Emily Carr so taken with the spiritual nature of Harris's art? Despite her youthful rejection of organized religion, she was nevertheless religious. Through her earlier art, Carr had already begun to search for deeper meaning. Harris's approach to transform nature in order to achieve spiritual expression was therefore an answer to a great longing. Carr's association with Lauren Harris as an inspiration and mentor would indeed carry her through her later years. But let us back up now 15 years earlier. After an ill-fated exhibition in 1913, Carr lapsed into a common plight of great artists. After the horrible rejection of her work in that year, she sank into a 14-year period of inactivity fueled by both diminished ambition and her reduced financial position. Between 1913 and 1927, Emily Carr produced only 20 small paintings. Therefore, back in Victoria, Emily Carr built a house on the land she had inherited from her father. The house was subdivided into four apartments, and her plan was to rent out three of them and keep the fourth to herself. She would continue to paint, supporting herself on the rental income. It seemed like a good idea at the time, but as Carr explained, no sooner was the house finished than the First World War came, 
Rental sank, living rose. I could not afford help. I must be owner, agent, landlady, and janitor. I loathed landladying. When she realized that in order to make ends meet, she would need more money than the rental income provided, turning her land to profit, she raised and sold English bobtail sheepdogs, as well as fruit, hens, and rabbits. Emily says, I do not say to myself, I will do thus or so. I leave myself open to leads, doing just what I see to do at the moment, neither planning nor knowing, but quietly waiting for God and my soul.